I, I believe this. I want God to speak to you. I really do. I said to the Holy Spirit this morning, Holy Spirit, let not one word, not one pause be anything of me, but everything of you. You know, when God speaks, I remember years ago being in meetings as a young Christian, God would speak to me. You'd be broken at the altar, weeping before heaven. And it's a long time since I've seen those days. And I believe this morning God will speak to us in a profound way that will affect us on the inside, you know, not in the head, but on the inside. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are ever present among those who love you. And I pray, Jesus, you would magnify your name in this place. Holy Spirit, you're my best friend. I ask you now to sovereignly just hover upon everything that is said. And I pray that this morning that you would speak profoundly to all of us and that we would leave this place transformed. Jesus, honor, I honor your name this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. If you turn me to the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John is probably my favorite gospel. Chapter 6. If you can put up that um, visual in the back, that would be great. You can. I'll, I'll read these verses quickly because I know time is permitting. After these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw the signs which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up onto the mountains, and there he sat with his disciples, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this is, this, sorry, but this he said to test him for he, he sorry, for he, sorry, oh, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, he said, 200 and already worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of the, them may have a little. One of the disciples, Andrew Simon, Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, a number, about 5,000. And Jesus took his loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to disciples and disciples to those sitting around, and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments of five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Everybody knows this story. It's almost uh, taught in Sunday school. And so we all know the story very, very well. But sometimes we miss things in the story that we're supposed to see. And I've seen things in this story that I haven't seen ever before. And my first point is this, if you want to write it down. Never underestimate what's in your hand. Never underestimate what's in your hand. Of all those people, it takes a child to bring something for lunch. Of all those men, 5,000 people, there's one small boy that has something in his hand that's going to affect everybody. Everybody. Now, I asked the question this morning, what has God placed in your hand? And ultimately, I want to say this, whatever God has placed in your hand is actually not for you. It's for those around you. That boy was carrying a lunch pack that day, maybe a small lunch box. Maybe it was for his family. 
Maybe his uncle, his auntie was there. Who really knows who was there? But the very fact was he had something in his hands that was going to affect everybody that was gathered. Now, friend, I want to ask you this morning, what has God actually placed in your hand? What has God given to you that can affect a multitude of people? The, the remarkable thing about this boy is this. He wasn't going to hang on to the very thing that was in his hand. Now, you've got to take into consideration that this was a child, and most children are selfish. I have three children, and even at 18, sometimes they, she's acting selfishly because she has a lack of maturity. But I can see in the body of Christ, often there's a selfishness in the body that they have so many talents, so many gifts, so many abilities, so much potential, but they're hanging on to what God has given to them rather than using what God has given to them to affect the multitude of people. You see, that little boy could have walked off into a corner and had his own lunch knowing that everybody was hungry. But the very fact is this, that he wasn't willing to hang on to what God had given to him. He was willing to give it away to bless everybody that was with him. Now, I want to challenge you this morning that maybe you are one that has great ability, great potential, great talents, but you are holding on to what God has given to you. Wherefore, you should be blessing not just the body and the house of God, but also blessing those outside of the body. God showed me, the Holy Spirit showed me this morning, all those 5,000 people represent the world. A group of men were hungry. They were longing for food. Let me tell you something, friend. The world outside these four doors are hungry for a visitation of God. They're hungry to see the demonstration of the kingdom of God. They're not interested in a church. They want to see something bigger than a church. They want to see the reality of the kingdom of God impacting them. It takes one child with one small lunch to impact 5,000 people. And I ask you this morning, in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus talks about the talents. One he gives five, one he gives three, one he gives one. And out of the three men, there's one man that does nothing with the talent that God had given to him. There are many people in this room this morning, and I, and I challenge you this morning that God has blessed you with so much. God has given you so much, but often we're not willing to give it away. We're willing to hold on to it, store it up, and keep it for ourselves. Yet Jesus said, whatever you do, do not store treasures on this earth, but make sure you store treasures which are in heaven, which will have an everlasting effect. Friend, I want to tell you this morning, that little boy, that child, maybe he was a teenager, maybe he was 10, maybe he was 11, had a tremendous effect with the very thing that he had in his hands. Never, ever underestimate what is in your hand. When Moses stood in the Red Sea, he was waiting for God to do a miracle. Yeah, God speaks to Moses and says to him, what is in your hand? I want you to use the very thing I've given you to part the Red Sea. Why as, as Christians, why are we often waiting for God to do the miracle when he's given us the ability and the talents to do the miracle? I've heard for years, we need a revival, we need a revival, we need a move of God. Let me tell you, friend, the move of God is when the church realizes what they have, what they receive, and then do something with the very thing that God has given to them. My second point is this, never underestimate the investment you give. Oh. Never underestimate the investment you give. Let me share this with you. Every one of us in this room invest every day. 
either way. You're investing for good or you're investing for bad. Everything you do every day has the tag investment. We all think investment is money. Well, actually, the word investment in the English dictionary means to achieve a certain goal or get to a certain place. That little boy with a small lunch was going to invest it in the kingdom in order to bless a multitude of people. Why is it we don't really invest in the kingdom? Why is it we don't really invest in the work of God? Why is it, honestly speaking, I was praying about this this morning, why is it we all struggle with tithe and offerings? What's wrong with us like? Why is it when we're in a place of famine we hold rather than giving? Let me just share this with you. We don't belong to the economy of Australia. We don't, I don't belong to the economy of Ireland. I belong to the economy of the kingdom of God. And this little boy shows me very clearly a representation of a kingdom mindset. Now you have to understand he's 12 probably, yet he has the mind of, a, of, of the kingdom of God. He understands clearly that with this small little thing that he has, he's going to invest it in Jesus, knowing that when he invests it in Jesus, there will be a multitude of blessings. You know, I, in my church at home, I'm being honest with you, I'm being frank, most people don't tithe or give. And they're loaded, like they are loaded. Now, I mean loaded. People who are earning huge money said, Pastor, we'll give 50 euro a month. I feel like saying, keep your 50 euro. Because you're not giving it to me. You're giving it to him. This little boy challenges me, and I hope he challenges you. Why is it we hold back from God? What is it? What, like, what is in our hearts really this morning? Why don't we really, really give? You know, when I was a young Christian, a young Christian growing up in the, uh, when I got saved, it was all about a surrendered life, not a partial life. This boy gave everything he had. He's a representation of a surrendered life, a life that's willing to invest everything. You know, I was taught when I got saved, you, you have no more rights. I was taught, now you, you, you can have no bitterness, you're not allowed to have anger. And I remember coming off the streets getting saved. I wasn't a church goer. I'd never really been to church, taking the understanding of all this. But we just obeyed because we felt that was the right thing to do. I remember, I remember getting 500 quid out of an accident. I was hit by a motorcycle. It was a funny story. And I, I ended up getting 500 quid because I was hit by the motorcycle. And I remember going to church really happy. And, and, and this elder said to me, now you have to give 10%. And I said, you matter what? 10%, I've given my tithe. And he said, no, 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 no. Your life is not your own. Everything you have belongs to God and everything. God gave you that 500 quid. I said, God didn't give me that 500 quid. A solicitor gave me that 500 quid. He said, no, no, no. He said, who's in control of your life? And I went to church, took out the 10% of the 500, put it in the offering, and then I gave an offering, and then I took everybody for dinner. Why? Because I realized at that point, everything that God gives me is not mine, it's His. And whatever God has given to me is to bless those around me. It's not about me. It's about everybody outside of me. Everybody outside of me. That child knew that day that everybody was hungry. They were a representation of a broken humanity. They were a representation of people who were hungry for something. And he stepped out among all those people and walked to Jesus and invested all that he had to give to others. And this is what the Holy Spirit showed me. He had the wisdom to bring a packed lunch that day. All those people around didn't have the wisdom to bring something together or bring 
something with each other to bless them on the journey. He had the brain cell to bring a small lunch, but knowing that in the moment he would give it to Jesus, he would invest it in the kingdom of God, knowing that he would give to all those people, and all those people would remember that day for the rest of their lives. Friend, whatever God has put in your hand is not for yourself. It's for a broken world that one day they will know that they have met with Christ. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where is your investment? What are you investing in? Are you investing in the eternal purposes of God? Or are you investing in your carnality? That's the answer. That's the truth, friend. When it comes down to it, I invest every day. I invest in my children, I invest in my wife, I invest in my church, I invest in prayer, I invest in studying the Word, I invest in meeting with people, I invest with praying with people. Why? Because it's not about me, it's all about Him. Hallelujah. 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 Friend, when do we really surrender? When do we really surrender? I tell you when we're really supposed to surrender, when we're in a place of famine. When things are lacking, when you look at your little bank account and see the zero, zero, zero. And then you go to church and you hear the pastor saying, Toy, and you feel like strangling the pastor saying, do you understand my position? Let me tell you, I understand your position because I've been there many times. I remember as a young pastor, I used to earn about 200 quid a week. I was working part time. Every Thursday, I'd run out of petrol money. I used to tithe, offer, and I think I was left, left with 100 quid at a time in Dublin when it was booming, when everything had reached the height of, of blessing in Ireland, that, that money was everywhere, but I had none. I remember for weeks not having any meat. We, weren't, we didn't have enough money to buy meat. And every week I'd give my tithe and my offer and say, Lord, your word says you should provide. And I'd go away. And one day I was sitting in the house and this young girl knocked on my house, a neighbor, and she says, um, I, I don't mean to be rude, but I work for a meat company. I said, wow, hallelujah. <laughs> Sandra, not the veggies. And then she said these amazing words. She said, but I'm a vegetarian. Hallelujah, Lord, you're speaking. You're speaking. And she said, every day I get this box of meat. Rashers, sausages, steak, everything. She said, would you be offended? I said, sister. I nearly kissed her. <laughs> and then I realized you've been investing for years. Now you're getting your return. Very good. Let me just show you some. You all think sowing a seed is investing. It's not. Sowing a seed is one thing. Investing in the seed is another. Now let me show you some. That child, it's amazing, this kid. He had the brain cell. Not just to sow what he had but to invest it in the right soil. We as Christians, we sow seed everywhere. And then we wonder, where's the return? But we haven't sown into the kingdom soil because only the kingdom will give you a big return. Do you know how I know this? Because Jesus said this in the Gospels, that you may be fruitful I have a friend who has a friend in California. He's a very wealthy, multi, multi, multi-millionaire. He's a farmer. And every year he buys $10,000 worth of seed, a special seed. He said if he doesn't spend and invest in this seed, he never gets the fullness of the return. And then he says this. He says he waits for the right time when the soil is ready for this actually seed to be planted into the earth. And then he told me this. I couldn't believe this. And every single day until harvest, he will check on the seed that he's sown and make sure that the investment that he put in the earth is going to give him a return. 
that child gave to Jesus. Not fully really, really knowing that the return was going to be above and beyond anything he had ever seen. Now let me show you something. He gave, you got to get this. He gave at a time of famine. Because there was no food for the crowd. There was no food for Jesus. There was no food for the disciples. And there was no food for 5,000 plus. It's a lot of people who are looking for lunch. Now he could have sat in the corner and said, good luck to all of you. I'm going to enjoy my little dinner because I had the brain ball to make sure I brought my lunch. Who does that sound like? The church. Bless me, Lord. Bless me, Lord. That's all we sing about half the time. Lord, I want you to bless me. Yet the Bible says it's more blessed to give. Actually, I don't really see it in the Scripture. Just bless me, Lord. I see it in the Scripture. Lord, that I would be a blessing. That I would give to those in need. Those who are struggling, those who don't have finance, those who are in need in every department of their life. Lord, use me to be a blessing to them. You see, we can only be a blessing, listen, you got to get this, when we fully give ourselves to the kingdom of God. Not to church, you got to get this. I don't want you to be a church member, I want you to be a kingdom builder. There's a big difference. You will never sow to a church, but you will give to the kingdom. Because it's bigger and it's, it's much more, much bigger than the church. That child gave to the kingdom. And what an investment he made. Oh my gosh. What an investment. It's time for us to invest again. Really invest. Not this half measure stuff. You know, Jesus said about the widow with the small little kind. She has given out of her poverty. They gave out of their wealth. What she's done is greater. Now, you have to stop for a moment. We read that scripture verse over and over. She gave equivalent to one, probably two, less than two euro. See, Jesus is not speaking about what was in our hand. He was speaking what was in our hearts. You see, that child is not what was in his hand. It was what was in his heart. And his heart was there to give and to invest that everybody would be blessed that day. Can you imagine the conversation that was happening within 5,000 people? They were all probably slapping them on the head, giving them a high five, telling them how wonderful he is. What a blessing kid you are. You're amazing, son. You, are, you did the right thing. You did the right thing. We're all great at doing that. But when it stops at us to do the very same thing, can you imagine when a church comes together and will invest together into the kingdom of God? Can you imagine the amount of fruit and multiplication that will take place in the house of God and in the city? Because when you invest together, it's not about you together. It's about those outside the four walls that will feel the blessing of a great investment into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, hallelujah. That crowd to me represent my neighbors. Represent my family who aren't saved. Represent my friends who are not saved. They represent everyone that we bump into every single day. Every single day. They represent the marketplace. You know, most Christians are miserable. They go to work every day and people can't even see Christ in them. And they wonder, is Jesus real? Friend, when you start to invest in your spiritual life, when you invest in your relationship with Jesus, when you are willing to surrender your life to Christ again, 
You see, we think it's a one-time affair. It's a constant surrender. Because the Christian life is a process from here to eternity. It's a process. I remember my father-in-law telling me, and this man was like Jesus, like this, this fellow was like Jesus. He was the humblest man I ever met in my life. And I remember saying to me, son, God is still dealing with me. And I remember looking at him and saying, if he's still dealing with you, there's no hope for me. And I remember him, Pastor, we were saying to me, son, God will be dealing with you until you go to eternity. It's a process that keeps on going and going and going and going. And I said, why is that, Pastor Weir? He said, because every day God wants a bit more of you, that he will take over you and break you and mold you and shape you and then break you to give to the world. Remember, Pastor Weir saying, how much more breaking, Pastor Weir, do I need to go? He says, there's a lot of breaking in you, son. God needs to break you and mold you and shape you and then give you to the world. And you know, I never shared this on Friday night. To speak at a woman's conference was actually the most amazing thing for me. I'll tell you why. Because I was a very bold boy when I was younger. I did terrible things that I'd never repeat to girls. And there I was standing there. The Holy Spirit spoke to me. said, son, because you surrendered everything, now I can use you in front of those that you, weren't, that you were unkind to many years ago. Do you not think for a moment where that child ended up? Maybe he ended up as one of the greatest apostles or disciples in all of Israel. We don't know. We only know a moment. But what we know in this child is this friend. He was willing to give everything that he had. He was willing to give his talents. He was willing to give his potential. He was willing to give his ability. He was willing to give everything that he had in his hand for the kingdom of God. When the church realizes how blessed it is, how talented it is, how much potential it has, how much ability it has when you give it all to Christ and allow him to take it and mold it and shape it and then give it to the world. We will see salvation after salvation after salvation. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. So my challenge to every one of us, me included, because when you preach, you preach to yourself. Is this, it's like the old song, I surrender all to thee, my, all my hopes and plans I give unto thee. We don't sing songs like that anymore, do we? Let's be honest. What do we sing? Half the time we're singing stuff that doesn't even make sense. And I'm not that old. I mean, I'm 30. What are you laughing for? That's the truth. I had a hard life. You ever hear that story? Oh, but I had a hard life. I need to hold on to my lunch. You don't realize what I've been through. I don't really care what you've been through. The moment you give it to Jesus, he'll heal it and set you free. But the moment you hang on to it. You know, as I close, one of my favorite movies at Christmas, you're all going to laugh at this. I love Christmas. My wife is a Christmas fanatic. It's like jingle bells in my house. It's everywhere. My favorite film is Scrooge. And I love the last part of the movie. When he goes to the house where he hasn't been so unkind, where he's been so unkind, and he buys them a turkey. He buys the whole family all that they need. It starts one way, but it ends a different way. Friend, it's not how we start. It's how we end. And maybe today, now I haven't used this word for years. Maybe today you need to repent. You know, repentance actually means more than just turn. The word repentance means change your mindset. Maybe today your mindset has been wrong when it comes to investment. Maybe your mindset has been wrong understanding the gifts that God has given to you. See, I believe any gift that any person has is for the glory of God. I believe Michael Jackson should have been a worship leader. It was God's gift to this man and to the world. 
Every gift you have is from God. Everything that you have is from God. And just like Scrooge, he had to be taken on a journey to realize how blessed he was and how much he had. And then at the end of the movie, he gives it all away. I'm reminded of Mother Teresa, who spent a a time in Dublin City, not far from my house. I'm reminded of this little, little woman that decided one day to leave the order that she was part of in India. Reminded that when she left that day and walked the streets of Calcutta, she had less than 50p in her pocket. Yet look what she did, helping the impoverished and the poor of Calcutta. She left the mark in life that we all speak about. We read our book, we read the life stories of all these great men and women. I'm reminded of C.T. Studd, the missionary to Africa. I'm reminded of Hudson Taylor, the missionary to China. I'm reminded of Amy Carmichael, the missionary to India who was Irish. I'm reminded of all these great missionaries. They have all one thing in common. They gave all they had to the kingdom of God. Friend, God needs to raise up a generation of C.T. Studs and Hudson Taylors, Amy Carmichael's again, people who are willing to give all for the kingdom of God, willing to give everything, every penny, every drop of your blood, every talent, every ability to give it for the kingdom, to give it for Christ, because oh, that's all we'd be remembered for. When they bury you and put our headstone, what will they say in our headstone? He gave it all. She gave it all for the kingdom of God. She gave it all for the glory of Christ. She gave it all for this nation and the nations of the earth. And when you walk out of here into eternity, what will God say to you? Will he say, well done, good and faithful servant. Oh, hallelujah. Friend, it's time again for the church to give it all. I don't know what your situation is financially. I don't know whether you're in a time of famine or in a time of lack. But I want to tell you this, there is no lack in heaven. There is no lack in heaven. And it's amazing in that story that they all came with so much lack and it took one child to change the whole situation. Maybe it'll take one of you in this room today to change the whole situation. Maybe it's time to build that church and finish it off. Come together and let's raise the money to build it and do it very fast. Why do we have to wait when we've got the body that will give a hallelujah? Repentance means change of mind. And I'm challenging you this morning to change your way of thinking and surrender everything to Him. Amen.